Okay, this is quite informal. Um, and there's not very many of us, so please feel free to just speak up or whatever if you have a comment or a question. Um, but what I want to start with here, um, we're talking about the threats and then what we can do. I also have a few little blurbs about um, what we can do at a town level because I never know in my audience who's going to suddenly become, you know, on some town steering committee or something like that. And um, people who are um, regular old citizens suddenly are in a place where they can help to promote regulatory aspects of things that are going on in towns. So I do kind of um, will include some of that. So what are we talking about here? So one of the things that we're talking about is runoff, you know, and part of the story behind runoff in built environments, and of course, this is very extreme where you have like the city and then you have the country, but it gives you this, this concept that every time we um, harden a surface, whether it's cement or just hard packed dirt, we limit the amount of infiltration of rainwater and any water that's percolating through the ground. And it actually has a really big impact. So for example, um, you move from 55% runoff of the water that's up in the environment to 10% runoff if you go from a built environment to a natural environment. And you can kind of get a sense pretty quickly that um, if you were considering like a small stream watershed, and while we we don't consider like Obviously, our our houses and lawns and and pretty gardens don't look anything like a skyscraper environment. It would it we do harden the environment by just um, having driveways, patios, rooftops, lawns that are driven over more than I think fourteen times a year are considered as hard as cement. So. If you have a place where maybe on the lawn that you drive over it regularly, it gets impacted by that. And um, so therefore, you know, it doesn't take too much to, to really reduce the amount of infiltration. And the reason the infiltration is so important is because the more runoff you have over the landscape, the more potential you have for the water to carry pollutants into the estuary or the lake or pond or marsh, wherever you're living, um, which is what we're trying to control. The number one uh, source of pollution in the country uh, is, oops, and you can't see because I've got this thing over it, but it's sediment. Um, and so what happens is, and you can see this one image of the little rivulet along the driveway there picking up all the brown um sediment it's carrying that sediment down the hill and the sediment is just little bits of material that are in the soil and the rocks and the dirt and before long that sediment has gone into the lake or the stream or what have you so when that happens um sediment does a number of things <laughs> it blocks the sunlight so that the plants are not able to grow very well. If the plants are not growing well, then you don't have the same level of dissolved oxygen that plants would normally provide, um, including seaweed provides, provides oxygen into the water. So um, it also can carry nutrients with it. And when you have nutrients entering the water that are in excess of what should be there, it may cause an algae bloom. You have an algae bloom, then that can result in what's called this eutrophication, which is when you have um, the algae dies, the bacteria are consuming it. The bacteria are animals and they resp respire and they breathe oxygen. They use up a lot of the oxygen that's in the water. And then you can also have eutrophication from that. So <clears throat> suffice to say, there are several ways that sediment can cause problems. And the primary ones are limiting access to sunlight and limiting plant growth. And the other one is by causing a, a decrease in the amount of oxygen that's available in the water. So how does that happen? You know, how do you get that, that sediment flowing down? Now we just looked at the one 
uh, image of the sediment along the road or the driveway, but there's actually a lot of different ways that erosion can happen. And some of these things that some of you are already telling me, um, you know, I have a steep bank or a steep hill and my house is there and I've got erosion and it's there. Um, well, you know, you've got ice and frost, you've got wind, soil creep, slumping, splash, sheet drilling. This is all different types of activities that water takes on. Waves, longshore and drift, and ice push. Um, a lot of the erosion that's happening on our in our lakes and our uh, along our lakes is actually from this freezing and thawing that we get now. It used to be that there would be one freeze and one thaw. And now we get freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing, freezing, thaw. And that actually is responsible for some of the erosion that's happening around the edges of the lakes and so forth. In addition to higher water levels and more water act movement. So there's, a, there's a, just a suffice to say, there's a lot of possible uh, sources of erosion. And we can talk about some of these more later. Uh, I do want to point out, so like this is obviously a rather dramatic image, but the picture on uh, in the circle there, um, I haven't seen anything that dramatic, but I have seen things that where the trees, um, so they come out of the ground and then they grow like a J and then they go up and it's because the hill that they're on is slumping and moving and the tree wants to grow up and so you can see how much erosion is. If you're wondering, like, is it just this part of the hill or is it the whole hill? Sometimes you can look into the landscape a little bit and see, okay, like, well, actually, maybe it's not the whole hill that's slumping down. Um, so maybe it's just this lower part that may help you figure out, like, what the problem is. Um, and... And then this image is also showing like, okay, there's bedrock. And then you've got this, in this image, this whole lawn, um, it looks like it's creeping and you've got a number of problems going on there. <laughs> um, so um, two particular things that we'll talk about a bit more about are the destructive causes of erosion related to the removal of native vegetation, both in the water and on the landscape and the hardening of the shoreline. Um, and the reason why native vegetation is so important uh, in this regard, it's important for our wildlife as well, but it's also important in terms of controlling erosion because the roots, and this is actually just an image related to the um, prairie out in Minnesota or something. So it, it's just for looks, not for actual information, but the if you take a lawn the you know you know how deep the roots are in your lawn if the grass is this long the, the roots are about like that um <clears throat> whereas if you're planting other native vegetation like either native grasses and or whatever other types of vegetation you might consider um the roots are going to be roughly equal to the mass of vegetation on that you can visually see above the ground so um let's see and the hardening of the shore so this is an image i this is a stock image that i took off the internet somewhere but um any kind of hard surface along the shore it doesn't matter if it's a rock natural rock or a man-made barrier of some kind the energy of the water has to go somewhere so if you've got any kind of wave action from a boat or a storm or a tide or anything the water comes up and hits that barrier and then it doesn't just disappear so it either is going down or to either side and that's why um there has been a reduction in the amount of like sea walls that are allowed because we've learned that we can build a sea wall for example but if we do that energy is still going to dissipate somewhere else and some it's basically just passing on the problem to some other landowner at some point. So, all right, so now let's go through some specific areas that you might be wanting to talk about in terms of either your own property or sometimes people want to talk about their neighbor's property um, or um, just kind of how to how do we evaluate, you know, the, the properties in terms of their impact on water quality. 
So one area to start with is the driveway or the camp road access. Um, if it's a paved road or a paved driveway, um, the, you will not see most of these things that I'm talking about. But what you will see is that at the end of that paved area, especially if it's on any kind of an incline, the water that goes over it has to go somewhere. And the paved roads, the water is going to travel much faster. So the impact at the bottom has the potential to have, you know, there's quite a bit of energy sometimes, you know, as the water runs over the pavement. If it's flat, there'll be less of an impact. Um, so basically, um, you're looking for the stability of the, whether it's paved or dirt, uh, gravel. Um, you're looking for stability in the soil, in the gravel, uh, in all parts, the surface that you drive on, um, the sides of the uh, driveway area, and the ditches themselves, and any area where the water is allowed to accumulate, like if it has some kind of runoff mechanism kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, at the end of this driveway, you want to see what the impact is. So like if the water's allowed to run straight down it, what happens to the water when it gets to the end? Um, so one of the things that we look at is, um, so I, I should back up for a moment. So I do a program called, a part of a, a statewide program called Lake Smart. And Lake Smart, what we do is we go to properties and we talk to people um, it's a voluntary educational program. And um, we talk to people about their properties and how they can minimize the impact um, that they're having or that property has on water quality. It's um, something that's been developed for lakes and ponds, but I really see all the same principles as applicable to any marine environment or any, any water body really. Um, so I'm happy to come to people's properties and and talk to them about things that they want to ask me about. Um, the Lake Smart evaluation, the actual evaluation, we, we go through a sort of a review process and then a full evaluation. And then if they are certified, they get a nice sign. And I'll show you one at the end, but the sign says Lake Smart Award. And what that means is that they have met all the requirements that the state has for um, kind of living lightly on the landscape. And so that's where I'm getting a lot of these principles from and just my experience in terms of going out to properties and talking to people about them. Um, these, this is complicated. One of you mentioned that, you know, there's a, I think it was um, in, it, is it in Camden that you were talking about how more folks are living along the body of water then, and this is happening everywhere. Like there were camps that were maybe just inhabited in the summertime. Well, if you've got people living in a place year round, you have very different requirements in terms of plowing. So these razor bars, for example, that have been put on this camp road um, are to move the water off the, the, the driveway periodically. So it just, the water, you can't tell how much of an incline it is, but there's an incline, the water comes here, it hits this razor bar and it's moved off to the side and there's a catchment basement somewhere just in the woods there. There's the low spot. And then again here so that the water isn't traveling the whole distance and then into the lake. Well, um, what happens is in the, these are, are somewhat problematic, unfortunately, when you have people plowing because obviously if the plow hits it, it's going to rip it out. Um, so people are trying different things. They're marking the sides of it and asking their plow guy to lift up the plow or asking the plow guy to not plow as, you know, right down to the surface. There's some different things that are possible. The other thing is that um, if you have a situation like this, there are some other options. Um, one is you dig out, um, essentially, uh, it's an open top culvert. And so the water goes down into a grate and into the culvert and that you can, um, yeah, you wouldn't want to hit it with a plow, but it should be plowable. Um, so it isn't easy. Um, the picture up on the right hand corner just shows you that like the, the just digging out the 
dishes and so forth um, is good, but there has to be somewhere for the water to go. And the dishes themselves can create problems if set if they're not um, if there's no catchment basement, you know. So if there's if there's a lot of water continuously traveling, it might be contributing to the erosion problem. So just to say, just a ditch may not solve the problem. Yeah. Back in the 1960s, I had a farm off the three mile dirt road. And the road commissioner always put in water bars yeah. in the active road surface. Yeah. They were big enough so we got a bump. Mm -hmm. And even in the winter when they plowed, the plow just ran up and over the bump. Yeah. It slowed it down. Yeah. And also it gave it a lot of hills. Yeah. And the all things converted back and forth. Right. And that would be another way to do it, as, as long as it's the surface is solid enough for the plows to, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so another area we look at consistently, of course, is the septic system. And we mostly are asking the homeowner, you know, is there a regular pump out schedule for the septic system just to make sure that it is um, not being overburdened by waste uh and then just checking that there are no trees where the um septic and the leach field are that are growing into that area and really any any trees um or woody plants need to be removed from a septic system or or leach field area um these are responsible for a lot of nutrients that go into our waterways and so a septic system that's not maintained properly is potentially contributing a lot of, of nutrients, even um, if it's a ways away from the water itself, because what happens, depending on the slope, the type of soil, uh, you can have, you can have uh, wastewater moving into a lake or so um, stream. Um, okay, so moving into like, we'll look around the house and specifically looking at drip lines. So again, back to the sort of the beginning premise of like, we just want the water to infiltrate. So if there's a way to slow the water down and let it percolate into the ground before it runs over the landscape, that's the best thing. So these are just some images of things to do and things not to do. <laughs> um, the first image of the gravel uh, in, the, in the lawn there along the cement, um, that's just an area it, it has eroded slightly and i don't know if that's an incline or not um but seeing that gravel there does show me that there is actually some erosion happening there um if you mean if you you what well, at least i think there is based on this image um because the drips are coming down onto where the gravel is but it's removed the soil on either side so you you know, if, if this was your home, you probably would want to look at finding a way to build up that gravel and find a way for the water to travel to some place where it can percolate and not just run over the lawn and into the lake or whatever. Um, the image on the bottom there looks much more stable. The bottom, the white stones with the white trim or the white uh, clapboards because there's no sign of the water being able to go anywhere. Um, French drains are often used if you have a place where you've got a lot of water and you need to move it somewhere else. So if you've got a drip line or a gutter and you need to, for whatever reason, there's another part of a building or there's just isn't room, um, you may need to move the water from one drip line into another area where the water can just be um, percolating into the soil. Yeah. Uh, the yard and the sort of recreation area where you where your home is um, is important. And these are just a number of things that you can do to promote the the percolation of the rainwater and limit the amount of runoff that's getting into the lake or the stream or the marsh where you are. Um, so there is this sort of uh, slogan, lakes like less lawn. And um, that's because lawns tend to be fairly hard packed. 
and um, they also tend to be, um, they don't have, there aren't deep root systems in them. And so the potential for uh, rainwater to run off them, like we've talked about, is fairly high compared to native vegetation that has different lengths of, different depths of uh, root mass and so forth. Um, the more forest duff, duff, uh, leaves and mulch you can leave on the ground, the better the percolation is gonna be because that material will just kind of hold the water in it for a period of time and it will either evaporate or it'll go into the ground. Um, but if it's a smooth surface, the water is much more able to run over it. So we just say, don't rake, don't leaf blow, whatever, you know, anywhere along, especially like between the home, the yard and the edge of the water, whatever you can leave there was gonna be best. And um, the other thing about a lawn is because of the nature of the way we care for a lawn, we tend to smooth them out. And so if you look at the natural ground, it's gonna have divots and areas where there, you know, there's rises and, and falls and so forth. And um, if you make it flat, it's again, much more easy for the water to run over. But if you've got divots and so forth, the water's just gonna seep into those places, sit there for a period of time, and, and then it's not gonna run off the, the surface. Um, okay, so lakes like less lawn. And these are just the images of what can happen. Um, you've got this image here where there's just water sitting on top of the lawn. It can't infiltrate anymore, um, either because the rain was so hard and fast like we just had, <laughs> or because the ground is so hard that it, it just can't move. Um, and then the lower image, you can see like, that lawn there in front of the house and the and the um bit of the driveway and so forth there the grass can't grow well and the 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 soil and the the gravel and so forth in the driveway isn't stable so there's just a whole lot going on there in terms of water running off um as compared to this is a um house right on in Kemiquid pond actually which has native vegetation, it's not far from the edge of the water. It has big trees. It has, you know, all the way down to ankle level um, <clears throat> growth. And the, the best kind of buffer, what we call buffer, which is that area between the recreation or the house and uh, areas and the edge of the water is going to be, again, the surface of the ground is uneven. And then it has multiple layers. So it's got big trees with deep roots. It's got mid height plants of various sorts. Um, and then it's got some real, it's got low level plants like wintergreen and so forth growing ankle high. And then it has the forest floor, the duff, and the soft material that's absorbing water and slowing it down. Um, so, pathways. So really the guiding principle here is you just don't want to make them wider than they have to be because um, the, the, you have that much more potential for, for runoff and erosion and the pathways often are going to the water. So all the more reason that you want to um, make it this way. And the other thing is if it's a straight shot like that middle image, it's very easy for the water to run straight down something like that unless it has some kind of drainage. And this one does have this, um, it's a different kind of razor. And then it's got this area for the water to just sit inside those stones and seep into the ground. Um, but you can see that even with th that short area between the photographer and the water bar that there's a lot of movement of the soil and so forth. It's not very stable. The image um, with the the stones um, and the wood that around them. So that's a, those are infiltration stairs, stairs, and that's a good way to make a pathway in, a, especially on a relatively steep slope and you're trying to minimize the amount of um, impact on, on the um, lake. Because all anything that falls in those stones is just gonna hopefully percolate into that area and then into the ground. 
Um, you'll notice that it's fairly clear around the side of that path. And there is the potential for water. You can actually see there has been some erosion here. And so really there should be um, minimally some mulch or something put there. And they may wanna to try to figure out where is that water coming from? And that's another aspect of this is a lot of times when I go out to people's properties and they're looking at a particular problem where you often have to sort of backtrack up the hill or whatever to try to figure out where is this problem coming from and how can you redirect the water? Uh, because if you could redirect the water so it's not even going down the hill, that's probably your best bet. Um, and then the pathway over um, the vertical image with, with the steps and so forth. <clears throat> I, I don't know how it got that way. <laughs> it's not an image I took. It's just one I chose off the internet. Um, but obviously, heavily used path. Maybe people stopped using the steps and started sort of, you know, trampling around the edge. You know, they were kind of carrying their kayak up, and it's hard to step on steps. And so they just sort of ended up damaging the sides. And as a result, um, the grass and the erosion is happening on either side. So um, you know, in that case, maybe it's not, those steps are maybe not ideal for that situation is my guess. Like there's something else going on and Jim is slamming the door, which is making the whole building shake. <laughs> um, we do also have to just kind of keep in mind when we're doing any of this work or, um, considering any of these issues that we have a shoreline zoning act in the state of Maine and in many other places. And there's, it's a whole bunch of regulation. Your um, code, office, code enforcement officer should be able to help you interpret it if you're not sure, you know, if you're allowed to take down a tree or not, or what have you. Um, I will say one of the things that I see over and over again um, being, um, not adhered to is that ground cover and natural vegetation to be maintained within a hundred feet of the water body. So um, there are places that are they you know I guess grandfathered in because they've been the, cleared for a very long time. But um, a lot of new houses and I there's one right near me in, in Walderboro right now um, <clears throat> where they've gone in and they've just taken out all the natural vegetation. And that is not hold, upholding the natural uh, or the Shoreline Zoning Act. And so I encourage people to speak up to their code enforcement officer if they see something like that happening because um, code enforcement officers are very st are stretched very thin. Town won't be a bit knowledgeable about what's going on. So unfortunately, it's kind of up to people to say like, hey, you know, I don't think this looks right. Um, so, um, if you are interested in working in your, you know, in the area, but 250 feet or closer to your water, then you do need to be really, um, mindful of the regulations and, um, I'm happy to help interpret some of that, but your code enforcement officer is even, um, a better person because they're going to have to, in some places they have to check off on what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Saying, um, that's covered up. Oh, sorry. Always, I'll just move it for you. <laughs> oh, sorry. That wasn't what I meant to do. Um, yeah. So no clearing opening can be created within 100 feet of great ponds or within 75 feet of other water bodies. And um, so most towns have like 75 feet of streams. Some towns have enlarged that. So you really should also check with your local um, municipality in terms of its regulations, because if your town has chosen to be more conservative about water protection, then they might have increased that to some degree. I was just talking to town manager and Dermot Scott about this. Um, he was saying, well, I was saying to him, like in light of storm surge or deluge rains that we get right now, you know, so we all of a sudden now we get two or three inches of rain instead of like a one inch storm. And as a result, the water's moving harder and faster. So we might want to be more, like as a town, we want, we want to be more conservative and increase some of these protection areas, like not 75 feet may not be enough if you've got that much more water 
trying to get into the estuary or whatever. Um, so with climate change, we also may want to be sort of mindful of this. Um, sleds of cutting of trees and shrubs cannot exceed 40% in a 10 year period. I see that occasionally um, ignored as well. Um, and then tree pruning is allowed but limited. Natural vegetation should be main maintained. There is, this is just like a very abbreviated summary. There's a, it, it's, it's a fairly lengthy descriptive document. So what about having only one that goes almost to the edge of the bank where the yeah. water starts? Um, is that considered ground cover or? It's it's not natural ground cover. Okay. It's not what was naturally there. So um, I don't know when it was like in your case. I don't know when that was established, but um, these regulations aren't that old. So it's you know it could have been a field even you know and yeah I don't remember exactly when this was implemented honestly. Um, a lot of times people had you know cleared area, then it became a field, and then they made it a lawn as houses were put in. And at the time, you know, there may have been more regulations about it. Um, but the reason there is a regulation is because it's important in terms of water quality, obviously. Um, so there are ways to um, take a lawn and put it back to something between, you know, maybe not natural vegetation might not be permitted in your case, but there might be some middle ground there. So let's talk about that. Like what can a buffer do? Like, if, you know, in your case. So this, um, these images uh, are just down the road from me in Waldeboro. Um, so the bottom image, this is, I'm standing at the banks of the Madonna and, um, or with my back to the Madonna and low tide and there's the intertidal zone and there's the bank. And then there's the tree and just on the side, immediately on like three inches on the other side of that tree is the road. It's just a small road, a uh, paved road. And then there's a house there. Um, and what's happened over time, of course, is that um, with storm surges and um, tides and so forth, we have, um, uh, you know, seen increasing erosion. And the other part of that is that as you know, the road used to be narrower, I suspect, you know, and there was more of a natural buffer there. And the road got a little bit wider and a little bit wider. And there's basically no buffer there. And people started mowing um, all along there. And I actually talked to them about not mowing there. And now they, they don't mow. And so, but it's probably too late. There's probably, the road is going to fall into the ocean. <laughs> so at any rate, um, but we could maybe save it up. The, the town did put riprap, the big blocky rocks there, um, because I recommended it because the bank is just gonna, it's right on the edge there. Um, and that's not ideal because it's going to erode on either side of that riprap. But those banks have more natural vegetation, so I'm hoping they'll hold on for a little bit longer. Um, but if we lose that tree, like all that dirt right there is gonna go away. Um, and then this is something we commonly see now, fortunately the top image, you've got, it's the same bank actually, um, just a little further down that way. And you've got the bank and then you've got, as it erodes underneath, there's chunks of it that have slumped off and down. Um, if the vegetation was bigger, stronger, more heavily rooted, um, more consistent, you know, maybe that wouldn't have happened. In some cases, it may happen regardless. Um, sea level change and storm surges are um, pretty hard to, to really limit, fortunately. On a lake, it's totally different. Like, you can really stop erosion much more successfully on a lake. So how does the how does the buffer work? Um, this is kind of what we've already talked about, but um, the tree canopy is important because it intercepts raindrops and slows down that energy. 
the leaf surfaces, same thing. The lower herbaceous plants keep everything from entering the water bodies along with the root systems that are absorbing the water and nutrients. So if you've got nutrients coming from the land, whether it's from septic systems, even natural, you know, well-working septic systems are contributing nutrients to some degree, uh, that all those roots are gonna help to absorb everything. The top image of the image there is in Booth Bay. It's a photo I took of a property. Um, you can't really tell. The water is over there on the left. The house is it's a quite a large house up on the right, um, and with a very manicured lawn. But they did allow to um, develop this. And this is actually a mixture. It's actually mostly not native plants. This was just there. Um, they actually hired someone to come and put this in. And then they made like a little wandering path. Um, but it's very stable. And the area above the water is very stable. And the area from the lawn to the um, vegetation is very stable. It's not going anywhere. Um, so just back, this is the rip wrap I was mentioning. Um, sometimes there are cases where you you kind of have to, it's the only option available to you, which is to harden a surface. Uh, if you have something that you're going to actually lose, it's going to crumble into the water. Um, and maybe you've got good secure banks on either side. Uh, I wanted to point out juniper. It's kind of prickly, so you might not want to put it right next to your uh, walkway where you're going to get poked with it, but it's a great plant for if you've got um, either rocky outcroppings or shallow rock, uh, shallow soil with rocky areas. And it's a native, there's a native juniper and this is how it grows. And it doesn't grow high. So people that are looking to preserve a view or some open area, it's a very useful plant for that purpose. All right, now we get into people's photographs a little bit. Um, so I'll just point out that that upper right is the Lake Smart. It's the old Lake Smart sign. There's a newer Lake Smart sign there. Um, all right. So Lorraine and Bruce, this is, well, you have to tell us what we're looking at here. Okay. Well, this is our humble abode and, uh, it's, uh, uh, a contemporary design. You can see uh probably if you look on the left picture you can see I, I, I how close i am to the water and uh i have uh a, a dock that starts here drops down and then it goes off into the water there's a little path that goes down to where that other float is i'm in the process there of taking the the float out of the water for the winter so um but anyways, uh, this is a view from our dock and you can see where the lake meets the shore and you can kind of get a, a, uh, an idea of our, uh, the angle that goes down into the water. You can see the leaves are, you know, have come down off of the trees. It is natural. We don't have any grass. Um, we have all kinds of trees uh, around our place. As a matter of fact, when we bought the house, there was a tree that was actually a, attached to the deck. <laughs> and uh, so technically, maybe we had a tree house, but uh, um, it was a danger uh, to the to the structure. And I, I, I've gone to the code officer uh, a number of times, and he has agreed to let me take some trees down um that are in, uh in that would endanger our house so but um there's another picture i i thought we had uh oh, Sarah. That's okay yeah see i have yeah um oh yeah the um i just wanted to say right along that shore there was um so there's where we have the dock and then as you go along there's a little beach opening where the where the where the um on the top right um kind of on the top right is where we bring the dock up and that's where there is a little beach opening if you look on the bottom picture as a matter of fact there's a little beach opening as you go along and then the uh brook 
flows into Bisky Pond as you go further along before you come to where you see some white rocks. That is our neighbor's property. So he's got a white rock um, buffer border um, uh, bordering his um, his lawn. He has a lawn and white rocks before the water. And we just have a, a the steep incline down and um, and no buffer other than this yeah, this sheet metal. We've only had it a few years, we should say, um, too. But um, uh, the, there was a, just a, this was like a silver sheet metal kind of, you know, uh, I don't know if you have a picture of that, but that's what's kind I of- I didn't see it. I mean, I-, I, oh, I oh, okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's, um, yeah, uh, on the top I, right is our, is, is, the rock wall, which is on the left side and the driveway, there's three levels of this rock wall, which is really kind of eroding down. Um, on the top right picture, just in the very tight rock corner is the beginning of this big boulder. But that's like a hill. I mean, it's a steep hill. When people come over this hill, it's like a roller coaster. You cannot see down. That's how steep it is on the crest of this hill. And then you go down. So at the bottom of this little hill is our uh, property nestled in. So anyway, but I'm sorry that um yeah the picture of, I thought I that didn't well you probably I, did I just didn't include it I that's just, okay well the the one thing I would say is um there are spots where I think someone has tried to abate the erosion but the vast majority of our waterfront I feel is natural. It's, you know, the rocks, it's, there, there's no retaining wall. Um, it's just naturally rock. Yeah. And uh, so, so I uh, you mean, uh, you know, like I said before, everything is stable right now, but I'm a little concerned. Um, you know, certainly there is runoff from this area into Bisky Pond, but uh, um, I am a little concerned with uh, some spots because it's, the angle and uh, uh, you know the future. I think at some point it's going to drop into the lake. And where these two men are, my son and some uh, some help we bring in the dock. Um, that's like where on the right side of the property where it's yeah it goes down from the on the right side of the house. It kind of just goes down a path, you know. So it's a pretty steep even from the, you know, pretty much you know after a while from the road goes downhill, but to the right of my son there is where there is the stream. And um, and just in front of where that white dock is, um, is kind of where just this little beach area. And you can see that's the little beach area where the sailboat is. Yeah. Well, stop for sure, yeah. Do you, do you think there's more water coming down your hill and eroding, like you talked about the big rock and the, and the garden area? Do you think there's more than there used to be, or is it just these heavy rains that are um more increasing and and maybe it's that that you're seeing or or maybe this is just more of the same i i think there's a little increase um uh because uh the stream was certainly naturally there um but the road the access road uh, which is atwood lane um runs parallel with the shore and people's driveways come off of it and it goes up and down and and water is running down the sides of it when we get those big downpours right. and it's running into the stream and then into the lake so i would think that there's got to be a little bit more i think underneath there's a, a fair amount of granite underneath the topsoil so it's uh i i think that uh hopefully that's a helpful thing in that uh it's it's not all like super ground sediment that's running into the lake or, right. you know, the water is pretty clear then that stream uh i think there's enough flat areas of this in the stream where it kind of settles down because right. if you go to where the stream enters into bisky it's pretty clear water yeah well that sounds that sounds hopeful yeah well, the rocks I've noticed really are looser. I mean, it's like I can't, you know, when I when I work in the gut, like around the gut rock garden there, um, I just can't even stand on them and everything. Um, and you know what, uh, Sarah, a chipmunks 
make a lot of holes between the rocks but that's yeah. i mean that's okay natural but um right. I don't know what, yeah, that, yeah, I'm just a little bit concerned about, you know, some of those trees roots up there on that hill there, maybe, and knowing the rocks, uh, that's all, uh, and the eroding of well, that little hill, which is true, right. like the rodent holes and so forth, you know, the, some of them will um, freeze and thaw a bit more. And the, when you're talking about the loose rocks and so forth, the freezing and thawing, we talked about that on the shore. It also, it holds true on these steep banks, maybe too, where you're getting freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw. And so things are loosening up maybe just because of that. Um, do you have, what's your predominant tree? Are there, are there a lot of hemlocks? I'm not familiar with any hemlock. Uh, we have white pine, we have oak, we have maple, beech, primarily beech. some ash and uh, some beech and a little bit of birch. Okay. So one thing I just, uh, it's probably good uh, that you don't have hemlocks really. Because um, one thing I talk to people about is if you, hemlocks grow very well in an environment like yours, a steep bank over the water, they love that. But we are, um, in, inundated with this hemlock woolly adelgid and it is going to be killing hemlocks and so if you're looking to replace trees one of the things you ought to be thinking about is you know which native trees first of all which native trees are less impacted right now by some of the invasive insects and just generally being diverse in your plantings so that if you do get hit by some as yet unknown insect <laughs> sort of situation or disease that at least you're not losing all your trees. So don't plant just maples thinking that that's going to do the trick because if you had a maple disease, uh, then you'd lose the maples there. So just continue to, you know, if you are replanting trees in places where, or, or shrubs and so forth, just encourage the diversity. And, and most people find that visually appealing too when they're thinking about their their habitat outside their, their house well if there's one that can uh uh discourage brown tail moths that would be great <laughs> well so yeah so oaks and don't plant oaks and don't plant um apples right next to your house if you're prone to brown tail moth issues yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got the oaks already, so. Yeah. Um, so this is just an, an image of, you know, um, I just wanted to point out, so there's the water in the distance of this image, and um, the water has been sheeting over this area. It looks okay, but um, what happens is the water is actually preventing a lot of undergrowth, except for just a few species from being able to take hold. And so as a result, you can see how unstable the soil is. It's eroding and so forth, and it's going into the water. Um, and so, you know, this is a place where if you had a place like this on your property, I would first of all encourage uh, maybe some hay bales along, this is actually sort of a channel um, to, prevent the water from going directly into the lake um, and then seeding in something that is going to, or maybe many different plants that are going to kind of hold that soil and maybe um, in some areas introducing some mulch or you can see that it's washed away all of the leaves and everything that would naturally be there. So just trying to kind of be supportive of the soil and allow that area to reestablish itself. Um, here's another image along a uh, waterfront and, you know, this is a narrow path. It's a winding path. It's got vegetation, um, on all sides. It doesn't have a big buffer. I mean, you can, first of all, can see how close the house is to the water. It's also one of these that's very close. Um, so, you know, to the degree that you can, I would work on building up that buffer because you really want um, I mean, lake, the Lake Smart requires a minimum of 10 feet of buffer um, kind of as the bird flies over. Uh, and that's probably not. And then it's very, it, it could do with more shrubs, more waist high, more hip high, more 
different levels of vegetation, but it has the good bones here, a narrow path, big trees, um, the mulch on the trail. So that's all good. Um, and somebody asked me not too long ago about vegetation in the water and what role that plays. And you can see here, there's lily pads and other vegetation in the edge of the lake there. And it's extremely important for temperature regulation in the water to have vegetation. It, in addition to holding the soil, it's also regulating temperatures, which is very beneficial for, for frogs and um, insects and fish and so forth. So um, in addition to the plants that are leading over the, over the water's edge, those are beneficial. Uh, I consider not putting this one in there, but uh, this is a situation where there is obviously some um, construction going on. And what you can't tell is the stream goes, um, it's, there's a stream that kind of off to the right side of that image. And, and then it goes from the telephone pole, the other side of the telephone pole, straight into the estuary. And um, the construction has been allowed to happen right up to the stream's edge. There's no protection there at all. And so there's a lot of rehab that's going to have to happen here. And I, I, I wish there was ways to um, continue to like protect the edges of these streams. Like that, in my mind, actually is a clear violation. And I did report it. Whatever it's worth. They shouldn't have been in anywhere near 75 feet of that stream. Let's put it that way. So I do have a lot of resources, including like the buffer handbook plant list, which I didn't print out here tonight, but I'm certainly happy to provide things. So if people want to either let me know what they need or um, there's a lot of resources out there and I'd, I'd be happy to help tailor them for what your specific needs are. So people should tell me, but there is a specific, you know, plant list that is helpful for people wanting to for, you know, increase their buffer. I also have an online program that's all about buffers and that's it. Um, and so uh, that's in our library. So if you go to like our path on our website, our past programs, there is a online program called build a better buffer from 2020 and you can access that. Um, and if you can't find it, let me know. Um, one thing I'll just I'll just promote another nonprofit. The Wild Seed Project is based in the Portland area, and if you want to get hold of native plants and you like the idea, first of all, they have plant sales a couple times a year, but they also um, sell seeds. And so, if you wanted to purchase native seeds, this is the best way to do it, I think. Um, and it's very easy to, they've got a number of educational articles about like how to sow seeds in winter, how to take care of them and what to do. Um, and so um, they've got a lot of material on their website that can help you. It's the Wild Seed Project. These are just some natural resource-based planning tools. You know, if you are working with your town on a municipal committee, um, I do, I do regular presentations for planning boards and so forth, but um, there's a, a number, I'm not gonna go into these all right now, but they're based on some of the same principles we've just talked about, and I'm happy to provide these to people if they're interested. And that's it. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So I am curious um, if anybody online or, Anywhere else has questions or comments? Sarah, I put a few um, comments in the chat, but oh, good. Um, I do I do have a, a scenario uh, at our place. We have a very old cottage, like a lot of the old ones, it's very close to the water. We have very little lawn, but we're really, really trying to um, keep larger trees um, along the shore and also keep a small area stabilized. But th in the past five or six years, we've noticed there's a ton of um, of freeze and thaw cycles on the water. Yeah. And that ice is coming way up and scraping away 
small plants, but also some larger ones like um, gray dogwood and button bush. So uh, it's become kind of a bare area. And I was I was wondering if if there's any way that I could get a hold of plugs, you know, plants that are plugs and have some sort of mesh to plant into that would stabilize those plants as they become established. Um, it is kind of rocky, bouldery. Yeah. There. Yeah. But are there um, like um, materials that you could buy by the yard that you can plant into to get plants going? That's a great question. I would ask Liz Stanley. Um, <laughs> she's the local expert on getting plants going <laughs> no i'm i'm the expert on what to do with the dead plant <laughs> oh okay <laughs> and why is it dead but anyway yeah. i liz let me let me do a little searching and see if i can find that um um i i i bet there are i mean maybe even just some of the sort of more standard um fabric type things that people use would yeah. be would be that would rot that. over time you know yeah, that right would go away right. yeah and and lee who's in your in-person audience she might know of some stuff that that might help because she's done a lot of these projects but oh. um but it's scary how how uh much of this between the really 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 heavy rain and the freeze and thaws, like we haven't been able to skate for a couple of years because of the freeze and thaw cycles. Huh. Uh, how There's much it will really change the shore? Have an idea. Let me let me just ask him what his thoughts are. Go ahead. Can you hear him? Liz? Yep. yep. It's on an island. We've had it for about seventy years, and the tidal rise, so the water is coming up. And we put in a new stairway to the dock, granite stones on top of the bed of crushed stone. And I wanted to stabilize the bank there. And we planted junipers. And I planted a little plant probably 10 years ago that was about a foot in diameter, a little juniper, right on a bed of big stones. That were yep. Big. And what I did is I used ground cloth and I made a little basin and put some dirt in it and then put the plant in it, a little more dirt and some mulch. And that juniper is now probably 10 feet in diameter and three feet high. And it just needed those few years to get its roots established and went right past the rocks down into the yeah. into the deep soil and we planted probably what, three or four other junipers underneath small spruce that my father had planted probably 70 years ago which were constantly trimmed off so they wouldn't block the view so it's like a hedge of spruce yeah and spruce is you put it on top of a ledge and right it grow yeah and yeah, I mean, Liz, what it, part of what he's talking about is the this method he used, which is really sounds brilliant. And then part of it is having the right plants, you know, and thinking about planting. And I know you know this. I'm just saying this for the world out there that, um, you know, it's a lot of it is thinking about, okay, so now you don't have a lake, like a uh, shorefront that has soil. And now you have, like you're talking about, it's like a, a rocky outcropping over the lake and it's an entirely different plant community that's going to grow there right uh, yeah so i wish i could get like um small plugs of things that grow there naturally like royal fern and um some of those really tough uh plants that have great roots yeah um a lot we're missing a lot plus we we've, we've got a lot of beaver activity so you know, they've taken out all the moose maple. And uh, so now we have screens around all the trees that we want to protect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, it's a challenge. It's so different now than it was. It is. It, yeah. 
It definitely is. Uh, have you have you tried growing things from Wild Seed Project who's making your own plugs? Because I don't know well, about it, plugs. Yeah, it takes, it takes a couple of years to get something that's got that's substantial enough. And it, I'm, it hey, I'm getting too yeah. old for that, you know. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. No, we, we work with them a lot. Yeah, they do great yeah. work. Um, I, think, I do have two suggestions. Yeah, great. This is uh, Lee's lab. And uh, Liz was um, saying I might have something to say about it. I had a, a garden design and build um, business for um, 25 years. I just retired recently. And a couple of things that we do um, that we've done that were successful. One is um, if you're planting on a steep bank, um, to plant things horizontally, plant the roots horizontally yeah. into the um, uh, the hill, and that way they're much more um, able to, um, you know, grow and growing sideways is easier for them, and it it reduces the erosion that happens when something's planted um, straight down. down. Yeah, that's so a that, good point. That's one thing, and another thing that we've done is um, uh, we spend a lot of time in Japan and something I noticed that they do there on very steep um, hills when they're planting is um, that we grew here in Rockport and a thing that we are doing um, is uh, build, building with these little kind of chevron shaped ribs using that are um, dug into the soil on the bank. And you can, you can build them out of um, cheap cedar shingles and um, stakes that you make yourself that are, you know, just great stakes. So it just kind of um, goes into the bank? Yeah, at, exactly. Yeah. So it, and you fill um, it or whatever with... Yeah, you kind of, you know, first carve the bank out a little yeah. bit, sculpt the bank a little bit, and um, build this little crib kind of thing. And I think um, I have seen that or... Sand it all down and make mm -hmm. sure it's stable, and then um, plant things like junipers in there, which will root in, and, um, and of course, spruces that will get really well um, rooted in. Yeah, and then over time, it just disintegrates, and um, mm -hmm. and uh, and the final effect is sort of a kind of lumpy, bumpy hillside, mm -hmm. which is what you want anyway, because you want for the infiltration of water yeah but those are two things that um, come to me that that's I'm great proud. could you hear okay Liz yeah I could I could hear that and um the the thing I worry about is sometimes like there's always this big inundation so here planting season is April May June and then we get these storms where the lake water level goes like way up and I would hate for any of that soil that I've made pockets with to get into the water so that's kind of the tricky thing like the right. lake level the lake level was so high this year the whole for the whole season yeah and, and this afternoon it was like really high. <laughs> whoa yeah but yeah. yeah i i need to try to do that and it's partly a choice of plants and it's partly creating a small space for them to get established in mm-hmm um, another idea too about that Liz is um, like after planting, mulching it with burlap and then rock. Um, so the burlap yeah. to keep the soil from um, washing back up through, and the rock holds the burlap down, and and then the whole thing just sort of disintegrates over time. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I think I know where to get some rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> very good suggestions. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. The burlap and rock. Yeah, thing. the burlap and the rock is good. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, because you. Away. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do you do talks for lake associations? Because yeah. some of the practices that people are, are exhibiting on lakes these days, especially where, where they're turning their seasonal cottage into year-round homes and installing lawns and stuff. I think that a lot of people are really unfamiliar with even the fact that Maine has a pretty strict shoreland zoning rules and towns are able to make them even more um, strict as well. But I, I think that um, the changes that are happening are really scary, 
especially since hemlocks are just disappearing and the water temperatures are going up. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yes, I do. I have limited capacity to do a whole lot kind of outside our immediate service area, but we can certainly right. discuss it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's other people out there too who can do similar programs. All right. Unless anyone has anything else, I think we're ready to sign off. Have a lovely evening, everybody.